Hey, and welcome to another Medical Director Minute. My name is Dr. Brian Everett. Today, we're going to be talking about blunt force traumas. So if blood force trauma, we're always considering about wherever patients could be bleeding that we can't see and how do we control that bleeding as best we can. Now, what patients are we worried about? These are patients that have sustained a significant blood force trauma. These may be patients that fall from a height, are involved in a motor vehicle versus pedestrian, have been involved in a motor vehicle accident where the patient compartment has been involved, were ejected, assaulted, or involved in an MVC that involves a motorcycle or ATV. So where can the blood go? There's about five different places that our patients could bleed into. The first being the long bones. They could bleed into the surrounding tissues and dump a significant amount of their blood into that area. They could also bleed into the chest, taking up those potential spaces. They could bleed onto the floor. They could bleed into their abdomen or they can bleed into their pelvis. So how do we fix these? Well, with long bones, we can place them in traction. With the chest, we can do finger thoracostomies, but ultimately we're gonna to need to get them to a surgeon. If they're bleeding on the floor, we wanna try and stop that bleeding as best we can and try to fill the tank. If they're bleeding in their abdomen, we try to fill the tank as best we can, but we really need to get to a surgeon. Now we might have some options when it comes to the pelvis. So let's look more in depth at the pelvis. If you notice on the picture on the right that the pelvis is extremely vascular and normally those bones protect that area and keep it very well protected. But if you notice on the picture on the left, when this area becomes broken, there's sharp bones that enter this potential space and lead to significant bleeding from that area. So let's look at a cadaver model of these potential spaces and the vasculature and nerves that are involved in there. So one points to the right common iliac vein, and then we're going to look at two and three, which are potential spaces. So there's the vesicular uterine pouch, which is a potential space and then retro uterine pouch, which is another potential space. In other words, these are areas that the blood can accumulate and lead to significant amounts of blood being dumped into this pelvis. Again, remember there's a lot of nerves there too, so it can be very painful. So we need to assess patients for pelvic instability. Now I'm sure we are all taught in school to rock the pelvis and see whether or not it's stable. But the question is, if pelvic fractures are so dangerous, how good are we identifying an unstable pelvis? So anytime we have a question, we need to go to the research and try to find out what does it tell us? So the first question is how reliable is an exam? So what we're gonna look at is what's called a meta-analysis. And this is where researchers take a whole bunch of other research and put it together and try to come up with a conclusion based off all the other research. So this research used the gold standard of the pelvic x-ray, and it found that depending on the way that the study was done, there could be a less than 50% to 100% sensitivity in being able to identify a stable pelvis. And that reliability decreased the lower the GCS. So for patients that are stable and alert, the physical exam can be very good at detecting a pelvic fracture, but that goes away when the patient becomes unstable and altered. So this is another study that looked at the clinical exam and its ability to screen for pelvic fractures. What they found miss rate at a GCS of 15 was about 6%. So again, a stable and alert patient, physical exam can detect a pelvic fracture. But if the patient is altered or has unstable physical exam findings, such as low blood pressure, your exam is not reliable. So who would benefit from having a pelvic binder placed? Well, those with severe pelvic fractures. When we place a pelvic binder, it decreases their transfusion requirement, it decreases their length of stay, and it helps stabilize that blood pressure. One thing that we're looking to do is to decrease the change in shock index that happens with patients during transport. If their shock index increases, it increases their mortality. So we want to do everything we can to try and stop major bleeding, and that includes placing a pelvic binder. So it is our recommendation that patients with severe blunt trauma that have unstable vital signs, a pelvic binder should be placed, especially in those that have a 
GCS of less than or equal to 14. To stabilize this nasty open book pelvis fracture and reduce hemorrhage, you're gonna to wanna to place a pelvic binder. And the most common mistake is to place it too high. So let's review the anatomy. When I stand here next to Mr. Bone Jangles, you can see my iliac press are all the way up here. And there it is on Skelly. And here's the greater trochanters of my femurs, which you can see on Skellingsworth here. And it goes around the greater trochanters. The greater trochanters, it looks low, but that's where you're gonna go. Now there's many different brands of pelvic binders, which isn't so important, and you can use a sheet in a pinch too. The most important thing is to remember that pelvic binders are just like real estate. It is all about location. And I repeat, it goes around the greater trochanters, not the iliac crest. It gets tightened, but not too tight and secured. I'm Dr. Jess Mason, and he is orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Stuart Kerr. So to note again, it goes over the greater trochanters of the femur, not the iliac crest. It's very important that we place the pelvic binder right. So let's take another look at a specific type of pelvic binder called the SAM pelvic sling. The SAM Pelvic Sling 2. Its new one-piece design is easy to use, with application now in just three basic steps. The SAM Pelvic Sling 2 is the first and only force-controlled circumferential pelvic belt designed to provide safe and effective reduction and stabilization of pelvic fractures. Users of the SAM Pelvic Sling 2 include both civilian and military emergency medical services, hospital emergency departments, search and rescue personnel, and wilderness and remote medical providers. Pelvic ring fractures are among the most serious of all musculoskeletal injuries. The mortality rate for complex pelvic ring fractures is reported to be 25% or higher. This mortality rate increases in the elderly and in the presence of shock. Physical examination is often inaccurate. Average blood loss can be as high as two to three units per break. Early control of life-threatening hemorrhage is the primary goal in the emergency management of pelvic ring fractures. The application of circumferential compression with a pelvic belt can significantly reduce and stabilize pelvic ring fractures decrease hemorrhage, and lessen the need for pain-relieving narcotics. The SAM Pelvic Sling 2 is a lightweight, durable, and effective force-controlled circumferential pelvic belt. It is available in three sizes, small, standard, and large, with the standard size fitting 98% of the adult population. It is the only pelvic belt or binder to feature a patented buckle designed to engage when the correct safe amount of constrictive force is applied. This buckle cannot be over tightened, providing an added measure of safety when the sling is applied on scene by all levels of trained EMS personnel. The anterior section of the sling is sufficiently narrow to allow for examination, catheterization, and access to the femoral vessels. Anterior external fixation can be applied without removing the sling. Also, the belt portion may be trimmed in certain areas if access is limited. The sling is padded for comfort and is radiolucent except for two small precision coils. Before using the SAM Pelvic Sling 2, you must read and practice the instructions for use. These instructions are attached to every pelvic belt. The SAM Pelvic Sling 2 is comprised of a soft padded belt with a plastic buckle attached to one end. This unique patented buckle is designed to engage when the correct constrictive force is applied to the belt. 
Next to this buckle is a loop of strong fabric sewn to one end of the belt that acts as a fixed pull handle. A plastic slider on the back of the belt is designed to allow the belt to easily slide along the surface of a backboard. The opposite side of the Sam Pelvic Sling 2 is a strip of perforated black webbing with a loop handle on the end. This handle is referred to as the free pull handle. One surface of this loop handle contains Velcro hooks designed to strongly adhere to the outer surface of the pelvic sling. Before applying the SAM Pelvic Sling 2, check the patient's clothing, belt, and pockets for any hard objects, such as a cell phone or keys. Next, locate the bony prominences on the side of the hips called the greater trochanters. These prominences are generally at the same level of the symphysis pubis and buttocks. This is the correct level for sling application. After you have located the greater trochanters, place the unprinted side of the belt under the knees and gently position the buckle off center. With your hands beneath the lower buttocks, gently lift the patient approximately one centimeter. Then slide the sling up to the predetermined level. Check again to ensure that the sling is centered over the trochanters and the buckle is off center. Next, insert the webbing through the buckle. Then grasp the fixed pull handle on the other side of the belt and pull the two handles in opposite directions. Pull until you feel or hear the buckle click or stop the belt. When you determine that the buckle has engaged, do not release tension. Maintain tension and firmly press the free pull handle against the belt. The Velcro hooks on the surface of the free pull handle will secure it in place. Do not be concerned if you hear a second click sound after the sling is secured. To release the pelvic belt, lift the free pull handle away from the belt and slowly release tension. Please note that the Sam Pelvic Sling 2 should be removed only under the supervision of a physician. The Sam Pelvic Sling 2 should remain firmly attached to the patient while in the MRI room. Again, here are the key application points. Always apply the SAM Pelvic Sling 2 at the level of the greater trochanters. This is typically at the level of the buttocks or symphysis pubis. Do not apply around the waist. When tightening the belt, pull until you hear or feel the buckle click or the belt stops. At this point, do not release tension on the free pull handle. Maintain tension until you secure the strap by pressing the strap down on the surface of the pelvic sling to engage the belt. The SAM Pelvic Sling 2, the first and only force controlled circumference. So a couple things to add there. One, let's make sure our patients that have sustained significant blunt force trauma get trauma naked so we don't miss anything. Number two, what if I don't have a SAM pelvic sling? What can I use? Two options. You could take the KED out, turn it upside down, and use that to apply force to the greater trick canters, or a simple sheet. Just as an aside, you may see a junctional tourniquet carried by the fellows out there. It's funded by a grant to evaluate the effectiveness of AJTs in blunt force trauma where the patient is in peri-arrest or arrest. It's applied to the lower abdomen and inflated to cut off circulation to the lower extremities. We have been able to gain pulses on one patient thus far, and we're hoping to see if there's any kind of signal there that these may be an option for patients that have sustained significant blood force trauma. Well, thank you guys for paying attention. If you have any questions, you know how to get in touch with me. You all be safe out there and continue to do great work. Thank you.